Everybody who, uh, who's here for the Q&A, please come on up to the front because I have a hard time hearing you because after a lifetime of having headphones on, I'm a little hard of hearing. Yes, I am. <laughs> this happens. Oh, this is so cool. I get to walk around. I can say, hey, hey, I'll be like a do a Donahue here. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Are you having fun? Did you buy lots of stuff? So your college fund is gone, then I take it. <laughs> well, at least it's not wasted, because you know it'll come back, and this will pay for your graduate school. Right? Oh, yeah. So I guess we're doing this on a wing of prayer here. Uh, I don't have a word. Where's my princess? Are you going to introduce or are you just going to be pretty? I will pretty? introduce you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody! Woo! I think I heard a better cheering section from the curling club. Hello! Welcome, everybody! I am your oasis, your panel princess. You guys are really nice, thank you. <laughs> uh, in the interest of keeping things fair, equitable, and fun, I would like to request that you please, 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 please keep the side conversations to a minimum. Turn off your phones or put them on vibrate. Yes, you are allowed to photograph this for the people who were stuck in the, ha in the Hasbro panel. But photography is encouraged. We will have question and answer panel in the interest of fairness as usual. Um, try to keep the questions to a minimum of one, maybe two, just because, do you really want to be stuck behind the person that's asking 20 questions and asking Gary to voice every character actor he's ever done and have to have an argument over who has the best pizza? No. So, <laughs> um, so that works. <laughs> So, thank you. Without further ado, Harry Chong. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Wow. Quite an introduction. That's uh, quite amazing. You know, I never get tired of looking at the, at the Beast Wars because the great thing about Beast Wars, it was, it was kind of an iconic show and then it was like the first CGI uh, animated uh, TV series before they even thought about TV series. And remember, Toy Story spent like 300,000 hours putting their show together and, uh, and putting out, I think it was a 48 minute uh, movie. And we were churning out uh, half hour episodes every, every few weeks. So you can imagine the amount of manpower and time that went into it. But uh, I never get tired of looking at it because it was such a, a great show. The characters, you know, excluding myself, I enjoyed doing it, but all the characters were fun. Like, how many people can, can, can if I say rat trap, they immediately hear, we're all going to die. <laughs> and Rhinox and, and Cheetor, hey, Big Bot. You know, all those guys and, and, and uh, Tarantulas and Ra Black Arachnia, the sexiest villain on TV. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, it's, it was one of those shows that has uh, real lasting power, and I, I quite enjoyed it. But, you know, aside from the Transformers, which, well, I've done you know, several iterations of the Transformers, Beast Wars, Beast Machines, Armada, Cybertron, Energon, all those, my first exposure to the Transformers, the first thing I ever did was the, uh, the commercials for the Transformers Generation 2 toys. And I don't know if you remember those, but Transformer Generation 2, battery sold separately. <laughs> that was, uh, that was quite, a, quite a long time ago. And when I got, uh, got signed on to, to play Optimus Prime, I went, okay, cool. Because I've been doing cartoons for quite a long, I've been doing cartoons for 30 years, and uh, I just didn't think that it was, you know, I just thought it was another cartoon, because it wasn't really part of my world. I mean, I, I, in my world, cartoons were like Mel Blanc, my idol, Dawes Butler, uh, Frank Welker, you know, all those, all 
those wonderful people who did, you know, Quick Draw McGraw and uh, Huckleberry Hound and all those kind of shows. And this one, I didn't, it just didn't twig to me. And then someone said, you got Optimus? And I said, yeah. Dude, what? Dude, you got Optimus. <laughs> yeah, so? Optimus is huge. And I went, really? Well, I never knew until I came to my very first BotCon. And I went to a BotCon in, I think it was in uh, Disneyland in Van Nuys. And I, how many people here have seen the movie Galaxy Quest? Okay, I remember when the captain walks in onto the floor of the convention and three girls were standing there and they went, like that, remember that? They were just overwhelmed. I walked on the floor onto the, onto the BotCon convention and there were three girls, just like the three girls in Galaxy Quest, and they stood there and they went, and they went oh my God, I'm in the movie. <laughs> and I, then it just struck me that, well, wow, this is uh, quite a thing. And, and over the years, I found that, uh, that, that these, uh, these shows, these characters are, are sort of models, a lot of uh, role models for a lot of kids. And I've said, a lot of the, the, the like, uh, moral codes and ethics of these kids said, you know, my whole life I, I grew up with these and I've sort of patterned my life after these kind of things. And if it weren't for that show, I wouldn't have done this or I wouldn't have done that. I went, oh, thanks. Thanks for putting that responsibility on me. <laughs> no. So now I cannot be a bad guy. I can't be, you know, I can't go rob banks or beat people up on the street. I have to be like the characters I play. And I try my best to be like these characters, except for the, uh, the character in T3 who says, kill them all. <laughs> no, I'm not like that. That's psycho, psycho optimus. So, well, I thought he was. I mean, how many people agree with me that kill them all was the wrong line for Optimus Prime? Huh? Yeah. Optimus is supposed to take, go after Megatron and, and settle it through diplomatic and peaceful means, not trying to kill everything in sight. You know, but when he said kill them all, I went, I was actually struck. I went, oh my god, does that mean I'm a, does that mean I'm a Transformers geek? I guess it does. I guess it, because it actually affected me. I'm watching the movie and I went, no. No, you can't say that. Anyway, um... So over the years, I've probably done about two or 3,000 cartoons and various movies and some of the characters you may know, like He-Man, Master of the Universe, and Dr. Robotnik, and Grounder, and uh, G.I. Joe, and Littlest Pet Shop, and T-Rex, and uh, oh man, I just can't think of them. There's, there's lots. Oh, uh, uh, Conan, but I didn't play Conan, I played Snag. Huh? Who's that? Captain N. Captain N and the Dream Patrol. Or no, Captain N the Games Master. No, it was Captain Z and the Dream Patrol. There's two captains. Captain N the, the uh, 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 Game Master was probably the most fun I ever had in a cartoon show. Because I got to work with Mike Donovan. I don't know how many people know Mike Donovan, but he directed most of the, uh, most of the uh, Beast Wars episodes and a lot of other cartoons besides. But he used to play a, ca a character named Eggplant Wizard. <laughs> and, and he used to go, well, I didn't do it. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, it just came out. And uh, I played the character of King Hippo. King Hippo used to go, excuse yourself, you pig. Oh, Eggplant Wizard, I did. I'm not decent. Get out of here. But it would, uh, we used to have so much fun because we were the villains and he was the wimpy villain and I was the big stupid villain, I guess. But yeah, as I say, over the years, many, many, many shows and many television movies and, and movies on the big screen and TV shows. I, I don't want to go through it all with you, but uh, some of you uh, have, have a lot of questions and if you do have a question, could you please come up to the microphone and ask? Because as I said before, I spent almost a lifetime with headphones on my ears, and I'm just not that great as far as hearing goes. 
Sure. So if you can come, if you ever, if someone has a question, if you're up front, I can ask, but if you're way in the back, you have to come to the, have to come to the uh, microphone. All right. Just for size, too. Yes, first question comes from a short person. <laughs> um, I'd just like to ask how it was working on Transformers Energon. On which one? Transformers Energon. How it was working on Transformers how, Energon. How you worked on Transformers Energon. Like how, how, what, has it? How was it? Yeah. Oh, it was fun, you know. I mean, um, the thing about, the thing about Transformers Energon, Cybertron, and Armada is that we have two different kinds of shows. We have what, what we call prelay shows, where you go in and record an ensemble cast and everybody's there at the same time, which is a lot of fun. Or we have the, uh, the ADR, or, or uh, additional dialogue replacement, or automatic dialogue replacements, where we take the Japanese anime programs and dub them into English. Well, when you do those, you do them by yourself. And that's no fun, because it's lonely in that studio. So you sit in there and you, uh, you watch the screen and it's, uh, it's, it's more of a machine kind of thing. I'm not really a big fan of ADR because in Japan, when they say thank you, they say arigato. But we say thank you, or they say uh, how are you, or they say konbawa. That's lots of syllables, right? Or doetemashita. So you got all these sim all these uh, all these uh, syllables that you've got to fill in, and when you're watching the screen, it just goes beep 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 talk, right? And you have to make it work. And sometimes it'll sound like this: uh, Oh, I see you have strawberry jam. I like strawberry jam, but I am more partial to raspberry jam. But strawberry jam is actually very good. And you're speaking in the rhythms and tones of the Japanese, which have a totally different rhythm. Uh, structure than English. So it's a very tough thing to come out with a with a performance that matches the performance in uh, in the prelay. Because prelay you create it uh, in, perform in, uh, in uh, ADR you're just adding to it. And I remember there were some complaints because my my Beast Wars uh, my Beast Wars performance is a lot different from from the Armada performances or from the Cybertron performances, simply because we couldn't have uh, the same input in the pre in the uh, ADRs we did in the prelay. So it was fun for different reasons. Technically, it was a challenge, and that was a lot of fun. Does that answer your question? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say that Beast Machines is my favorite Transformers TV show of all time. Thank you so very much. Brilliant. Woohoo! I, I like it too. I used to post episode reviews on all toys and Transformers as soon as that thing came on here on YTV. So, my question is uh, Peter Collins has gone on record saying that Prime is basically John Wayne. Primal seems like a lot more of a complex character, and I could never really figure out who his influences are. So, was there anyone you had in mind when you came up with, came up with the voice? You're gonna laugh. <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> because, I, I'll tell you straight out, uh, I, I have always been a, a stage and film actor, most of my life. And, uh, my school of thought is, is that the, the essence of every character is you in a given situation, which makes it real and gives it dimension and range. And uh, so, uh, fortunately, I have, a, I have a pretty good voice. And when I, uh, when I did Optimus, I just looked at Optimus and you go, well, what would it be like? Is he like someone's dad or like someone's uncle? How would I react in this given situation? And, uh, and and uh, that's what I did. So I didn't really follow anyone's pattern. I created my own. And uh, to my mind, I think it was a it was a, it was a pretty good choice. I'm not you know you know tooting my horn, but I'm just saying because I'm I'm basically a pretty okay guy. Just you know, hello, hail fellow, well met. I don't uh, my my philosophy in life is be kind, hurt no one, and it's a pretty good philosophy. And uh, I go by the basic. Uh, 
the basic commandments, not being a religious person, because I'm not, but do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, and, uh, you know, love God like you love yourself, and you'll be a fine person. And that's what I'm like in real life. And uh, that's why I try to uh, pattern the character after that. Awesome. Thank you very much. Is that fine? Okay. Okay, now. Which, which form of Optimus Prime do you prefer the most? I'm sorry again, you're too close to the mic. Oh. Which form of Optimus Prime do you prefer the most? Which former Optimus no, Prime? No, which form? You know the, uh, the Transmill Optimus Prime, the Optimus Optimus, the Beast, Beast Machine Optimus? I like Prime. Well, the original of them all. I, w I wasn't a big fan of, uh, of Transmetal Optimus. Optimal Optimus was kind of cool. I liked that. But Prime was my favorite. Primal was my favorite. Oh, I see. Okay, one, one, one more question. Why did you decide to work on screen work and, and movies? Why do I? Why did you decide to do, do work, work in movies, too? Why didn't I do the movie? Why did you work? I, I see you in a few Sir. movies, but I'd like to know why you chose that career. Why did I choose the career? Yeah, yeah, be on screen, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, but you're a little muffled down there. I'm going to come right down there to get it. I told you, I'm hard of hearing. Thanks a lot. That's even better. Thanks a lot. Thanks. No, 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 no. What did you say? I'm saying, why did you decide to work in movies? Why did I decide to work in movies? Well, I think because um, I, I wanted to get the chicks. <laughs> Because you know when you're when you're in the movies, you know you you get the chicks. Well, no, that's why I decided to become a rock star is because you get the get the chicks. No, I I, uh, I love the movies. I love everything about the movies. I've been a movie mani maniac since I was five years old. And when I first got a chance to work in the movies, it was the most magical experience I ever had. And I was working with one of my all-time heroes. You think, you, get, you know, when you get all choked up and, and sweaty and going, oh, I don't want to, hi, here I am. <laughs> and, I, and there was a fellow, I don't know if you're familiar, a fellow named James Colbert. Remember James Colbert? James Colbert was the first guy, the first celebrity to do a commercial on network television in America. And he said two words, and back then in the 60s, he got paid $250,000 for this spot. And all he said was, Schlitz, malt liquor. <laughs> and I remember him from the Magnificent Seven, and our man Flint, and all those. And I got a chance to work with him on a show called Looking for Mr. Patman, I think it was 1979, 1980. And I walked on set, and I met him face to face, and I said, I'm such a dork. I, I went, wow, you're so tall. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 we're working out. Yeah, we're gonna do fine. We're gonna be fine. Anyway, it turned out fine, but boy, I, from that day on, I said to myself, I am going to be in the movies for the rest of my life. Thanks very much. Next question. We have a moment here. A second. A what? Or you got it? Yeah. Uh, if, if I got a question. If uh, if Primal Optimus Primal uh, and uh, the Colonel from Star Eight. And uh, the, the, the character you're playing on the, that show, the killing the cop, if the, if they all if they all were were, were Smurfs. <laughs> now, I know who this question is coming. Who, who is this guy, Paul Ida? You think as a voice actor, you know to hold the microphone just a little bit farther away from it? Mouth. Okay, is that not good? Okay. Or my technique. Is that, not, is that not good? Is that is that too close? That's a little too close. Is that better? <laughs> so 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 if 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 Optimus Primal and 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 uh, the, the Russian Colonel from uh, Stark, yeah, and and uh, the, the policeman you play in uh, the, the Killing. Oaks. Okay, if you were all Smurfs, 
who would eat the most ice cream? <laughs> The biggest consumers of ice cream in the world are Russians. So, you know, Colonel Chekhov would like You know, he likes this vanilla. Vanilla. Like Milli Vanilli. That ice cream from Ben and Jerry. Milli Vanilli. I guess I think they got rid of that name because of all this scandal around the songs and stuff. But I like vanilla ice cream. And uh, Lieutenant Oaks, well, his favorite ice cream is. Uh, Tiger tail. You know that orange and licorice head just oh. Man, I absolutely love Tiger Tail. But don't tell anybody. It's uh, it's the best ice cream ever. But yeah, I think I, I think of all of them because he's so fat. Uh, Colonel Chekhov would be the one who ate the most ice cream. Yeah! a non-Transformers related question, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you worked on a number of shows in Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog and uh, reboot with uh, Phil Hayes. Yes. You uh, two did a lot of bouncing off of each other. What was that like in the studio and how did that compare to say when you were, Phil Hayes was replaced uh, by his comic Neil Ozpac in uh, reboot later on? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> different thing. Uh, Phil Hayes was a, or it still is, a stand-up comic and a, and a great voice actor. And Phil and I, well, we got this idea in our heads uh, way back in season one of uh, Reboot, because Phil and I played Hack and Slash. And he played Hack, and I played Slush. You know, they push the button, don't push the button, every time I push the button, something bad happens. I'm a Hold me, Hack. Hold me. You're touching me. <laughs> You're touching me in a place that makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm gonna show you on the doll. It was one of those. We just we, we 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 got it into our heads that we were going to improvise all of our dialogue. So what we did is we did the scripted dialogue, and then we put it to the side, and then we improvised dialogue to go around the story back and forth. And 90% of the shows, and, and unless it was a crucial story point, they used our improv dialogue. And if you listen closely, you can see that it's, uh, well, sometimes it's a little racy. <laughs> you don't quite catch it, but then you go, wait a minute. That's not nice. That's not for children. But uh, it was really fun. But as we continued on, we didn't know if the series was going to continue on, and uh, Phil moved down to Los Angeles, and uh, they couldn't afford the, the budget as they were a startup company at that time. They couldn't afford the budget to bring uh, Phil up to Vancouver all the time, and uh, uh, so for whatever reason, they decided that, uh, that Scott McNeil was going to play Hack. And uh, Scotty went... Does, does that mean we have to improvise? I said, yes. Yes! So we started and continued on the tradition of, of improvising all of our dialogue. And uh, I think Scott did a pretty credible, credible job of playing Hack, and he played it till the, till the series ended. There's a question. And then it was a lot of fun. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Optimus. How you doing? <laughs> Going good. <laughs> oh, excellent. I was wondering, I, I, I heard your, did, is, did something happen? You've lost weight. <laughs> I know. It's what the cost was supposed to be. Huh? What's your question, sir? Actually, I've been wondering. This is quick. Which one is 
is your favorite? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> sorry, this is taking so long. How come you? How can you like the gorilla version of Primal than the trans metal version? Because the trans metal, how do I, how come I like the the uh, the gorilla version over the the trans metal version? Because the trans metal version, well, it came at a time when the scripts were making all of our characters kind of, you know, bitchy and argumentative. <laughs> we never, we never, we just sat around and going, oh, I can't do this. I don't like this. Well, don't get in this. Well, you said this and you said that. They sound like a bunch of argumentative little kids, and I just got tired of it after a while, and so every time I see the trans metal, all I can associate is trans metal with those scripts that I really didn't like. And I don't make any bones about it. I, I didn't like the scripts. I told the writers, I told the directors. And uh, that's my, my own personal feeling. I still did them, but I just felt that we weren't really moving forward. We were sort of falling back into a kind of a malaise, a spiritual malaise. It didn't, uh, didn't go well for me. Optimus spending most of his time contemplating his navel rather than getting out there and getting things done. So that's why. And I've, I've been wondering, did you ever watch Transformers Dark of the Moon? I'm sorry again? The third movie of Transformers. Michael Transformers 3? Yeah. The movie? Yes. Did you see it? Yes, that? I watched the movie. I actually the fell asleep about three quarters of the way through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gotta say, uh, I, I, Nothing against the movie, I was just really tired, but the action was relentless. But I thought, I, 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 I've said this before, I thought that, uh, that uh, Optimus was a bit psycho in uh, T3. Fatality. That... Huh? Fatality. That's right. Kill them all. Come on. I just, but overall, the action sequences were brilliant. Again, I, I, and, there, and I found some of the voices I can understand, but a lot of the voices in the show and the movies in particular, like I cannot Nemo. understand them. And it's probably because I'm deaf, but I cannot hear their dialogue. And I'm sure they've got great things to say. I just couldn't. I couldn't hear it over the. <laughs> <laughs> That's Michael Bay for you. Huh? That's Michael Bay for you. Ah, Michael Bay. Michael Bay, the king of explosions and car chases. And did you see Laserbeak, that bird? <laughs> huh? You know the bird in the movie? In the movie? Yeah. I can do his voice. I'm not really Excellent. a voice actor, but I can do it. And I'll do laser. I'll be laser freak, and you can talk. Um, well talk done. Primal. So primal. <laughs> oh boy, we're gonna talk about this later. How to be a voice performer? How it's gonna happen? All right. So we're gonna move on to the next one. Good hand for this fellow for the good voice. Yeah, baby. Come. All right, so I've seen most of your works in Beast Wars, and I, I gotta say, Beast Wars is my favorite series. In fact, the writing, the characterization for all of them, and one of the few two characters I I know from that back that are most recurring since, since Beast Wars and the Unicorn trilogy is Scott McNeil and David King, who voice voice Megatron. Scott McNeil, in particular for Beast Wars, I want you. I want to know about a question, which of the four voice, major voice actors that you, voice that's he done was your favorite? Either was it Rap Trap, Zerubold, Dinobot, or Waspinator? <laughs> well, uh, you're talking about Scott McNeil's voices? Yeah. Of all of Scott McNeil's voices, my favorite one, just because of the comedy, my favorite one was Rap Trap. My next favorite one was Dino Bat. <laughs> uh, another one of Silverbolt, because he sounded like Dudley do -right. you know, <laughs> I'll save you now. You know, that character. I, I liked them all. I thought, uh, I thought, Scott is a phenomenal talent, you know. Uh, he's just got so many voices in his head. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a bit weird. It's very hard to, uh, you know, I think I've heard his real voice once or twice. No, I think I have. And uh, in, in the, like, I've worked with Scott McNeil for over 20 years and uh, always been a delight and a joy to work with. Lots of fun. But his characters, every one of them is so special. I, uh, I enjoy uh, working with them and playing with them. 
Yeah, I got another one more question. The, regarding the, one of the episodes of season one called Gorilla Warp Bear, which your character often probably gets hit by a poison from Scorpion Ox, where you where often probably comes like a terror. I ter can't. Sorry, you're muttering. I can't hear you, buddy. <laughs> you know, I'll like, come right up there. This is, this is a problem with being a little deaf. If you talk too fast or too low, I can't hear you. All right, so you hear in Gorilla War here, your character Optimus Primal gets hit by, by Scorpion, by yes. Killer Bee, and, you, and Optimus Primal becomes like a mad, mad maniac who goes around around the Predacon base, like doing, doing all the stuff that Optimus Primal would never do, do normally. How would you, explain, how would you describe about the recording in voice actor? Oh, okay, I understand exactly what you're saying. You're talking about the cat. I can't remember the, the name of the, ap of the episode, but it was Primal Primal, when P Primal got, uh, became a wild gorilla. He became an actual gorilla and started going absolutely insane. What? Huh? Call of the Wild. That was the episode. Exactly right. I remember that. Call of the Wild, where he becomes, a, and he starts doing all these things that Optimus wouldn't normally do. Well, I'll tell you, in the studio doing that, it was... A little hard because he did a lot of screaming and yelling. And I got to tell you, I thought I had cast iron uh, vocal cords until we, uh, until we did that episode. And by the end of it, I was like, oh, hey, can, uh, can we take a break? Because it was like, I kill everything. I destroy it. And I was, it was just killing me. But it was, uh, it, it turned out great, it was a great episode, but uh, that's what it was like. Really tough for all you prospective voice performers who, who have dreams of being a voice actor. Just remember that you have to train your voice to go through like that for hours. Thank you. You're welcome. Small reminder, because of the time now is 1.30. One question, maybe two. Keep it fast, keep it quick, and if you hand me your camera to record things, I'm assuming you're giving it to me, because you missed my birthday. <laughs> Next. Speak slowly, clearly, and loudly. Okay. I was wondering if you have uh, any toys of yourself, essentially, from any, not just Transformers, but from anything. Like, you have your a toy of Gutsman, or Hack, or sorry, Slash, or Optimus Prime. Toys that I have in my collection. Do I have any toys? Yes. I have this toy. No, I don't have it anymore. I gave it away to the Children's Hospital for a fundraiser. So I don't have him. I have Transmetal Optimus. I have the uh, Primal. I've got the other Primal. I've got Optimal Optimus. I've got Gutsman. I've got Hack and Slash, the original toy from the first year with the original CD. I've got He-Man, G.I. Joe. <laughs> I got Popeye, I got, um, uh, let me see, oh, so many toys, oh, uh, I got uh, uh, Conan, I got, um, I got a lot of, a lot of, because I keep one for my characters, uh, for every character I keep a toy, if I can find a toy, I'll, I'll put it in the collection, but I said before, I have a, I have an ego room. <laughs> yeah, you all know what it is. Don't lie to me. You all know what an ego room is. Everybody has one. Yeah, you've got one, I know. But the ego, the ego room is, is all the stuff I've done. I've got pictures on the wall of stuff that I've done and trophies and awards and, uh, and toys. And they're in the spare bedroom in the back, which I usually use for my ego room. But now I have a little Persian princess staying in that room. And she goes, oh my God, every time I wake up, I look at all these, you. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry. But uh, it's quite fun. So I, I usually keep a collection. And some of them are, are cool. And I, the coolest thing I have, I was telling somebody earlier, but the coolest thing I have, and I found it in the garage the other day while doing a garage cleaning, because my gal Zach was the uh, CEO of Mainframe at one time. I found the original story and character bible for Reboot. The original drawings before the show was done, I found the original drawings and the original storyboard, the, ori the original, uh, what do you call it, the pitch. It's a big binder and it's got all the storylines and all the original characters. And I went, oh, 
<laughs> oh my God. What the hell is it doing in the garage? Come on, girl. Put it in a, put it in a climate controlled uh, space in the house so it doesn't rot. But it's, uh, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm going through it and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember these characters. This is so great. But all the binomes and everything, they have all the different binomes and they have pictures of them all. Anyway, we got to move along. We got a bunch of guys waiting up there. If you had the opportunity to play any character in Transformers or otherwise, what character would it be? Megatron. Because <laughs> <laughs> he gets all the best lines. I mean, I would love to be able to say, Psych Goddess. I would love to be able to say, Yes. Well, I only get to say it once. But he says it every, you know, every second scene in a show. He's like, we're going out, we're going out after the Maximals. Yes. We're a nut bar. Yes. But, uh, yeah, that's it. That if, uh, if there was a character I'd love to play, it would be, it would be Mer Megatron. And uh, the other character I'd love to play in another show would probably be... Well, I'm quite partial to, uh, I'm quite partial to, uh, uh, uh Dr. Frankenstein in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Mega Man. Oh. I love that character. But that's, uh, that was one that was done by Ian Corlett. Oh, yeah. Or, sorry, no, not Ian Corlett. He did, uh, he did Dr. Frankenheimer or whatever his name Dr. was. Dr. Wiley? In Captain N, the Games Master. Oh, yeah. The of Dr. Wiley. Oh no, Dr. Wiley was the one I'm talking about. And that was by Jim Burns. That's another character I'd love to play. Awesome. Thank you. Next. What is the best and worst thing about your profession? Um, again? What is the best and worst thing about your profession as a voice actor? The best thing, the best thing and the worst thing about this profession. I guess the best thing about being a voice actor is... <laughs> Being a voice actor. <laughs> it's the greatest job in the world. You don't have to dress up. You don't even have to shave. All you have to do is have a good, good you know, have a good voice, have a good voice and shape. Walk in, walk up to the stand, put your script down, and let's go. And that it's, it's the greatest job in the world. To think that I actually get paid for doing this job makes it absolutely the greatest job in the world. Because it's, really it's really a lot of fun. The, the worst thing about the job is uh, that you're a voice actor and, uh, <laughs> and you're constantly looking for work. So occasionally it comes by, but then there'll be times when you're not working, you're going, why am I not working? What's going on? What happened? I don't suck anymore, do I? Do I suck? I suck! That's what happens, and you get this, this horrible feeling where you just think that the world's caving in because you're not working, and then all of a sudden you get a job, and you go, oh yeah, I'm cool, I'm back. But the, I guess that's the, the best and worst thing about it. The worst thing about, I guess one of the worst thing about uh, uh, being a voice actor is you're constantly uh, aware that if you get laryngitis, or if you get a cold, or anything like that, you're done. You can't work. And I had a I had a bout of this last year. I had viral laryngitis, which is probably the worst thing that a voice actor could get. And it put me out of commission for six weeks. And uh, it was killer. I hated it, because I couldn't do anything. And I'm thinking, is my voice ever gonna come back? And if it does come back, is it gonna, is it gonna sound the same? And thank God it did. So that's uh, those are the best and worst things. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. I was wondering, um, how did you transition into voice acting? Like, how did you get into voice acting to begin with? <clears throat> well, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the intro film, but I remember my first acting, voice acting job. I was going to Langara College, probably one of the greatest theater schools in Canada. No blood, no blood. No, but it is. It's, it's probably one of the greatest theater schools in Canada. And uh, my voice teacher said, you know, you have a great voice. Acting sucks, but you have a great voice. And I'm going, well, that's great. Uh, how do I do? So I went to acting school to learn how to act. And uh, after several years, I managed to uh, 
improve my skills and get things going. And the head of the school was this wonderful fellow who, who is still alive. It's, he, he celebrated his 88th birthday this year. He's been teaching since 1965, and he's been an actor since he was 20 years old, and his name was Anthony Holland. And Anthony Holland, who was my mentor, who, uh, when I went to theater school, I, I auditioned for him, and uh, I did a bunch of stuff, and he was reading a newspaper while I was doing my audition. And he looks up and he goes, well, uh, got some talent, not much, but some. All right, you're in, and let me in the school which was great, because they only take like 15 people across the country every term. So I went, yeah, I'm in. So at the end of my term, he said, you know something, I have a friend of mine, I have this voice over, he wants a voice thing, and you have a lovely voice, and well, he's got this nurse at home, and I'm wondering if you'd be so kind to, to do this job. He'll pay you. And I went, sure, okay. So I did a commercial for a voice at a nursing home, and got paid, and I went, that didn't take long. <laughs> okay, I'm in. So then I started pursuing it, and I gotta tell you, the first demo tape I made was probably the worst demo tape you've ever heard. It was, it was so bad that I cringe, and I get, I get embarrassed for myself when I listen to it. Thankfully, it's burnt and gone now. <laughs> so if you're looking for it, you'll never find it. <laughs> oh, it's buried deep with a wooden stake right through the middle of it. I'm our loving evil heart. <laughs> um, it was horrible. So I made it. I, I went to, I was living in Ottawa. You know Ottawa? Oh, yeah, of course you do. Well, do you know Shea FM? Shea FM 101.3, Radio Ottawa, latest hits, you know that one. Okay, Shea. Well, there's a, a company there called Sound Ventures. I'll, 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 I'll get to the chase. Sure. Sound Ventures. He asked, I went in there and I was, you know, going around meeting everybody trying to get a job as a voice guy. And uh, this guy, Chuck Rubin, who ran, who ran uh, uh, Sound Ventures and also worked with Chum Radio, said, yeah, I got this thing for the Ottawa Citizen. So I went in and did my perfectly articulated Ottawa Citizen ad, and he goes, Gary, I'm sorry, you're fired. And I went, what? You're fired, it's just not working out. And I went, wow, that's terrible. So I turned around, and I went back to him, and I said, look, Chuck, you've been doing this voice thing forever. He says, show me how to do it. Show me what I have to look for. How do I make this work for myself? And make me a demo, I'll do your next set of commercials for free. And he said, deal. So he taught me about mic technique, he talk, taught me about uh, breath control, about the different kind of voices. There's the breathy voice, there's the hard strident voice, there's the mud pit voice, there's the public announcement voice. You know, there's all these different voices. And, and he taught me them and showed me how to, how to make them work and then made me a demo, I'm sure as you. Uh, a set of commercials came up for Revenue Canada, funnily enough. <laughs> you know, paying your taxes here. And uh, I did them for free. And he made my demo. And that demo has made me several million dollars. So that's how I got started. Uh, by taking a lemon and turning it into, basically turning it into lemonade. Getting fired and turning it around to work it to my advantage. And... Uh, I've been doing it ever since, and that was uh, 1982. Well, thank you. You're quite welcome. <laughs> yes. Uh, what do you think of uh, animated Transformers animated Prime? The anime Prime? Yes. Not a big fan of anime. You know what I hate about anime? It's a very simple thing. Oh, actually, I, I meant uh, animated. Animated? Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, I love the animated one. Oh, now, yeah, I mean, my, my Optimus Prime, I love them. Optimus Prime, uh, the, the, the new one, the new Optimus Prime animated, love that. Anime, not a big fan. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the only reason is, it's a very simple reason. Sometimes the stories are cool. I love, like, Matt Cross and those kind of things. The thing I hate about the, some of the Transformers is they have little kids in them. Let's go, kids. Let's go save the world. I'm going, oh, 
Come on! Any responsible adult would put children in danger? What is wrong with you people? Are you psycho in Japan? Uh, I just, I just didn't, uh, I'm not a big fan. I hate it when they, have, they bring little kids who think they're just like, yeah, we can do this Optimus, and there's this little kid going, <laughs> back off. But yeah, no, I like the animated. It's it's fantastic. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Excellent. Thank you. Gary, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Right, I'm, ask, I'm asking this question on behalf of someone who couldn't be at the con today. Uh, with Beast Wars 15th anniversary uh, upon us, what are you doing to celebrate? <laughs> what am I doing to celebrate the 15th anniversary? Yes. Of Beast Wars? Yes. I'm celebrating it right now. <laughs> I've got to tell you, I, I honestly don't go to very many uh, conventions. I think I can count the number of uh, Transformers conventions on two hands. I think I've been to eight, maybe seven. I just don't go to many of them. Uh, they're a lot of fun, but this one, I, I particularly like this one that comes out here in Mississauga. I, I like the fellows who run it, and, uh, and this is as good a way as any to celebrate the 15th anniversary of Reboot. Or of, uh, <laughs> hey, I gotta tell you, Reboot, I've got Reboot on my mind because Reboot just, they, they came out with a box set yeah. just a few months yeah. ago. And I thought, well, it's about time. Because they've been quibbling and quibbling for years. They should have brought it out years ago to bring out Reboot because it's a, a fantastic show. And, uh, and the Beast Wars, the new Beast Wars uh, iteration, the uh, box set, I hear they don't sell it in Canada. They only sell it in the States. Boo! I have another Boo! Boo! Anyway, does that answer your question, sir? It does. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I was, a, growing up, I was a big fan of the show Reboot. Yes. And you had mentioned how you always used to improvise with Scott McNeil and Phil Hayes and you were hacking Slash. Yes. Can you describe the situation when you, with Michael Donovan, when you were Al's waiter and he was Al? Yes. <laughs> well, I think so. Wait, it should go like this. Hey, I don't think we should go in there. Man, I don't like it when we go in there. Oh, what do you mean? We should go in there and be good. What? <laughs> no, we can't go in there. Al scares me. He's so slow, but he's so loud. No, let's go in because I really like the menu. I don't want to get the menu. No, come on. Oh, oh, darn. The door's locked. The door's locked. I'll open it. Well, just push the button. I don't want to push the button. No, come on. Push the button. Push the button. I don't want to push the button. What? Who's there? I want to. I don't want to push the button. You push it. I'm not pushing it. No, you push it. Because every time we push it, something bad happens. The megabyte is gonna kill us. Thanks. Hi. Um, you and Rancy earlier around about the ADR process and having you know time, you know certain time to fill for certain lines, but. In Cybertron, there are a lot of power-up sequences and a lot of dead air. And as time went on, we started hearing your, like during sequences of uh, the Savage Claw murder, we started hearing your voice making comments about, didn't we do this before? And that sort of thing. Um, was that, do you know, was that, sorry, was that stuff that you would improvise, or was that stuff that was written in, just to kind of fill the long animation gaps? The best thing I wrote in? No, do, do you recall that that was stuff that you had ad-libbed during the, like the power-up sequences, the sock animations? To be quite honest with you, it's all a blur. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, I remember all the shows, but we would do like 10 shows in a day. And just bang them off and bang them off and bang them off. And to remember a significant line, I remember that we would add lines or add syllables to make it work. And we said, this is not a very, very happy, wonderful place for us to be, kids. You children, you small people, you kids, you small people, you children should leave. And we'd have things like that. I just go, oh, come on. <laughs> it would drive you crazy. But it's the way that they would go. And 
and then you had to fill in. Well, I don't think we should go. We should go over here. You know, you see what I mean? And I just can't remember them all. I'm right, sorry to say. You're welcome. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about some of your live action work. Yes, go ahead. A Watchman? Watchman. Yeah. And I was wondering how that came to be and how you're going to be and how the experience was for you. I'm sorry again? I'm wondering how the role came to be, how your role in it came to be, and how the experience was for you. Well, it's, it's very funny. The, uh, I, I played a general in this movie, The Watchman, which is a tremendous movie. Uh, with Zack Snyder, who was a, a wonderful director and, uh, and had great casting. It was quite fun, but the, the lady who was the casting director for the show, we've had a history for 25 years, and uh, she's always afraid when I walk into the audition room because she never knows what I'm going to do. Because I might just go, you know, I really don't like this line. It, it doesn't make any sense. Can we change it? And she said, there, no, don't, don't, don't say that. Don't say that. Well, why not? You know, I don't think I'm right for this part, but I would be good for this part. What do you think? And she'd get all bent out of shape. But for the Watchmen, I, I thought that it was another uh, big feature, and I, I, I would go in, and they'd bring someone from the States in to do it. And uh, I walked in, and I just had a, a, a crap load of attitude. But I really like Zack Snyder. He's a really nice guy, right? So I walked in and I said, "Okay, let's let's do this." And uh, did the audition and uh, told me right then and there, "I'm doing the part." And I said, "Okay, this is terrific." So I went to work on the show, and it was a very it was the first show that I've ever worked on where I've never seen the script. You only see the pages on your day, so they couldn't. So none of the story could be released, even though everybody's read the the. The uh, manga. They <laughs> he said no. The script is a little different. You never see it. So, but what a wonderful experience to work on that show. And I I wanted to work on Sucker Punch, and I got called back several times, but they went for an Irish guy, which was sad. But eh, there you go. Anyway, but uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think I'm going to eat this whole bowl of hard candies. <laughs> Good. <laughs> anyway. In uh, Beast Machine, what was your impression, reaction, when uh, Megatron took over Optima Optimus' body? Ow. <laughs> ow, ow, ow. I went, oh man, I don't want to die again. <laughs> How many times can you die in that series? But uh, it hurt. But only on a peripheral level. I mean, that's it. That's the only. I, I, I couldn't answer it any more concise than that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have five minutes. So. Oh, we got five minutes. Need to go fast or decide whether or not your question is important. <laughs> hey there. Um, in Freddy vs. Jason, you were the uh, sheriff. Yes. Um, I was just curious. Uh, were there any scenes of yours that got uh, cut from uh, that film? Because it seemed like the sheriff character just, uh, he's, it looked as if he was leading up to a good death scene from Jason and then he sort of just disappears from the rest of the movie. I was wondering if there were any scenes where he got cut. Well, I... <laughs> the thing about Freddy and Jason, it was, a, it was kind of funny because Ronnie Yu, who was the director who also directed Warriors of Virtue and things like that, he, uh, a Chinese director from China, and, uh, <laughs> funnily enough, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, every scene, if you notice every scene of Freddy vs. Jason, I say, we've got to keep this thing contained. If we don't contain this thing once and for all, things are going to get out of hand. Contain this now. And I'm going, I walked up to him and I said, Ronnie, you know, I say contained in every scene. He goes, yeah, I know. It's a big joke. You see what happened? You have this phrase, you know, you say, we've got to keep this contained. We've got to contain it, okay? So that will be the catchphrase that everybody watch a movie, they will see you say, contain, and they laugh. Very funny. We like it. But they didn't cut any scenes. All the scenes that I had in the movie were in it. It was uh, quite fun. But I, I've got to tell you a funny story. Ronnie Yu. Ronnie Yu directing a scene. 
Okay? Okay. You are scared, but you're not scared scared. You are more concerned scared. Okay? You know what I mean? You, you're concerned scared. You come down the stairs. You go around the corner, very sneaky. You go around the corner, you see that big fellow. You go, ah, ah. But you're not scared, you just got hurt because you are armed, you are a gun. Then you come back, you go sneaky up the stairs. Okay, you got that? Okay, go. Running in direction. The funniest guy in the world. I just, I just thought he was terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bring us back to the Transformers. I'm just wondering, um, for Beast Wars, and I guess you can count Beast Missions since, since it still had Primal in it, uh, what was the hardest line for you, like the hardest scene or line for you to deliver as Optimus Prime at any point? The hardest line for me to deliver was. Um, <sighs> the seeds of the future lie buried in the past. <laughs> To make it sound good <laughs> was very difficult, but uh, that's that's one line I seem to recall without without because that was when I was just pissed off about that whole navel gazing thing. <laughs> the seeds of the future lie buried in the past. Yeah, the seeds of the future lie buried in the past. No matter how I say it, it always sounded like you know Obi Wan Kenobi. Kind of <laughs> Didn't want to be Obi Wan. I wanted to be Optimum, Opti One. <laughs> but that was the most uh, difficult line. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Are there any cases when you're voice acting for a cartoon TV series and you won't be working with the Ocean Group as usual? I I must tell you I haven't worked with the Ocean Group in about 14 years. The last thing I did it. Oh no, maybe that's wrong. Because I got called in directly from producers in LA to go work shows in Ocean. And one of them was um, Spider Man. Spider Man, the series I worked on there. And the other one was, uh, I think it was uh, X Men or something like that, or Fantastic Four, I can't remember. But I was called in directly. And uh, but as I say, I was never allowed to work in that studio because of an incident we had many, many years ago. Uh, it had nothing to do with my bad behavior. It had something to do with the, the, uh, the studio that I worked in, called them on it, they got mad and said, you'll never work at this clown again. Well, I proved them wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Why well. Two questions left, that's it. Oh no, this is the last question. Gary, I just want to know, what is your most favorite line from Optimus Prime ever? Shut up, Rat Trap. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for coming out. It's been a great crowd, and we've had a wonderful afternoon. So glad to be here at Post Prop Gun. Have a great, great day. See you later. Bye. Thank you very much.